Good morning, everyone. This is Haryom from uh, Chennai. Uh, in a series of uh, webinar which has been hosted by CBNR, <coughs> this week we are going to talk about what is functional activity based approach. In the uh, last two months, we have been hosting um, broadcasting some seminars and webinars on uh, uh, neurology and also on stroke rehabilitation. Uh, for people who have already uh, listened to uh, one of my uh, webinars on uh, nonlinearity, this webinar will be a sort of continuation from what was uh, given as uh, a basis for how to uh, formulate your treatment. It can also be viewed as standalone, but we may not. Uh, dwell deep into the theoretical ideas behind uh, each and every principle we are going to uh, talk about. So what is functional activity-based approach? Um, before defining what I mean by functional activity-based approach, I want to emphasize that uh, any physiotherapy in neurology, uh, whatever you call it, is based on these four principles, the uh, principles of motor control, principles of motor learning, clinical evidence, and of course the patient. If all three things are combined, we get what we call as a functional activity based approach. Say for example, what does the principles of motor control say? As I told you earlier, we are not going into deep into uh, the motor control part of it. But the simple idea is any movement is a product of a person interacting with an environment to do a task. Then a movement emerges. The movement does not emerge or happen just because your brain is producing an impulse. It is also because of the brain is producing an impulse, but it is producing an impulse in reference to a task and in reference to the environment. That is your system is producing that. The next one is your principles of motor learning. There are many, many principles of motor learning, but the simple principle, what is the guiding of motor learning is do whatever you want to excel in and do it again and again. Say so for example, if you want to be Hussein Bolt, you just uh, go on training, 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 100 meters. In his book, he writes about in the early stages, he ran 100 meters uh, every day. His coach made him do it for 100 times. That is from morning till evening, he will do 100 times of 100 meters running. Um, so this is uh, what is the basic principle of motor learning. Whatever you want to do, do it again and again. Okay, these two are uh, principles of a theoretical principle. What does your uh, clinical evidence say? That is, you do research on patients with stroke, and what did they find out? They found out that one of the most important guiding principle is be task oriented. That is, do a function again and again so that you will get better. Remember, all these principles. Uh, have to be uh, in cohorts with your ability of your patient. Say, for example, in the acute phase, you may not think of making him uh, walk on a road uh, because his ability is less. In similar vein, if you are a school child, if you are in first standard, probably you will not be taught uh, algebra. You will start with basic one, two, three. That is what we mean by uh, ability of the patient. So if you combine all these things, we get what we call as a functional activity-based approach. Right? So why are we doing this webinar? One of the uh, major reasons is there is so much of confusion between uh, many authors and uh, many thinkers uh, between what we mean by uh, task-oriented or functional training. Now, uh, I just want to uh, give a simple historical perspective. 
uh, these two uh, women, uh, Karen Shepard, they were the uh, pioneers in what we consider now as a uh, task-oriented approach. They wrote the first book called as Mo uh, Motor Relearning Program in 1982 and later uh, they had uh, many, many uh, additions to it, and the last book they wrote together it is called as Optimizing Motor Control. They came up with a set of principles of how to do task oriented approach. And later on, uh, this woman, uh, she uh, she uh, uh, she is Annie Shambekuk, and along with Marjorie, they two bo both of them wrote another book um, called as Motor Control Theory and Practice. And they wrote a similar book to uh, what uh, they have written in MRP, but with a slightly different, uh, just a small change in it. And uh, we also have um, uh, tried to formulate a task-oriented approach or a functional training approach. And we just have a slightly a different view of what these four people have written and remember we are not claiming that we have written more than what they have um, said it's just a small variation in it so if you uh, want to understand functional activity based approach we want to understand uh, what we mean by that for that i have given a hierarchical or a classification system for physiotherapy intervention now i think there are two types of intervention one is uh, active another one is uh, passive any person who has practiced physiotherapy will know that an active exercise is always always better than a passive exercise. What I mean by passive exercise is passive stretching, passive uh, movements, whether you are positioning the patient, whenever there is no active participation from your patient, we consider it as a passive treatment. We all know that nobody is going to walk because we stretched. Nobody is going to walk because we, we gave a passive movement. We all know that the patient has to actively participate in the treatment, right? So in the active treatment, uh, I have subclassified again into two parts. That is one is impairment level intervention. Another one is activity or participation level intervention. What do I mean by impairment level intervention? Now, these are the, some of the examples which we all do in our clinic, right? So this is just an isolated knee extension. This is doing movement in a diagonal pattern. This is I have taken from a PNF book. This is a common exercise uh, everybody does, bridging to improve uh, lower limb activity. And I also have taken two um, pictures from another uh, hospital guideline. One is for moving the lower limb, another one is for moving the wrist. As you can say that, see that in the end of it, they have also given what is the command they are going to give. Now, what is common in all these things is, of course, most of it seems to be active. There may be some amount of active assistance, that is all right. They are all active treatments, right? And one important difference is it is the patient is not doing any function as such. What he is doing is he is trying to improve his activity, individual muscle activity or a group of muscle activity or stretching or any of these things he is doing isolated movements, right? Or a group of movements without doing any sort of function that is you can see in none of your patient is accomplishing anything in terms of function right so this is an uh, this is what was was going on for many many years uh, because the these uh, these things came from a motor control perspective of what we call as now as the uh, reflex hierarchical model so all these things uh, we consider it as impairment level remember these are active exercise not passive so what do i mean by functional level is 
people who are familiar with ICF will know that there are two uh, words. One is activity, another one is participation. Uh, simply put, an activity is any activities you do, or probably the activities of daily living is what we are all familiar with, uh, walking, eating, going to the toilet and things like that. And participation is uh, participating in the society, going uh, outside to uh, your friend's home, going back to work because we are getting a lot of uh, anger stroke patients wanting to go to the temple, all these things. So if you have an intervention where the patient is doing this, we call it as a function. And this is what we mean by a functional level intervention. And one of the most important things about a functional intervention is any moment, any function, remember, will always have a goal or a purpose. Remember, this goal and purpose is not what the, uh, the therapist alone defines. It is the goal or the purpose which the therapist and the patient together defines what is an activity or, a, or a, what's a goal or a purpose. We'll just go detail into each of these sentences. So this is what I mean by a, a functional activity. You can see um, two or three levels, two levels here. Again, you can see this part of it where the patient is uh, sitting and standing. That is an activity level. Uh, exercise that is he is doing an activity of sit to stand at the same time if you are thinking of participation where is going to sit to stand probably he is getting trying to get out of an auto because in the auto only he has to come to the clinic or in the auto he is going to uh, his neighbor maybe a car also but just in this example so if I am giving an intervention at this level then I will consider it as a participation level intervention. Similarly, I am teaching him to walk here and they have been taught to walk outside. So this is an activity level and this is a participation level. So if you give exercise in any of these levels, right, then we will consider it as a uh, functional activity based approach. So until this point of time, we have said that all the uh, evidence is pointing towards uh, activity-based approach or a task-oriented approach. And we have defined a task-oriented or a functional activity-based approach as in one where there is active, active participation of your patient and the treatment is at functional level, not at impairment level. So what is the first and foremost principle? The uh, idea is very, very simple. In a task-oriented approach or in a functional approach, we should do a goal-oriented, functional, active movement. Remember, it should be functional and it should be active, right? And anybody who has uh, any sort of uh, learning in their life uh, will know that if you want to learn something, we have to do it again and again. If you want to remember what are the parts of the FEMA, rem learn it again and again or read it again and again. If you want to um, excel in sports, say for example, marathon, you want to do that activity again and again. Right? If you want to walk outside and if you are a stroke patient, you will want to do that again and again. Remember, here we are not doing some isolated movements again and again. We are doing that functional activity repeatedly. That is again and again. From motor learning, we know that if the brain has to undergo or if the system has to change, Right, not just the brain, if the system has to change, we have to do it again and again. That is, we have to be uh, doing it repeatedly. The next part of it is we are doing some activity or a functional activity again and again. 
Now this is where a lot of confusion has arisen. So I have given two pictures here, picture one and picture two. It's the same activity that is sit and stand. Now I'll just ask a question, which do you think is going to be more meaningful or which your patient will think is going to be valuable in his life. Now you may have correctly assumed that picture one looks more meaningful for your patient because you may want to go outside and you may want to sit on a bench and stand up. Remember, there is nothing wrong in making a patient sit in a Swiss ball and making him stand. Only problem is the patient will never want to sit on a Swiss ball and stand up at home. So it just doesn't make any sense for you to sit on a Swiss ball and stand up in my life of 45 years old, I have never sat on a Swiss ball and stood up, but I have sat on a park bench or any other bench or a sofa. So the next principle is you want to do a functional activity, right? But that functional activity should be important not for the therapist or your medical community, but it should be important for your patient, right? So a lot of people think that they have to reduce synergy and uh, spasticity and things like that without uh, asking the patient, did they want to improve in these things, right? But at the same time, we will come to whether that will reduce that reducing all those things will lead to functional improvement in the next slide. But at the same time, what is far more important is for your patient to go back to work. So how are we, how am I going to rehabilitate in that? Walking outside the home that is going to the bus stop or going to the railway station or going to the uh, park. And more importantly, the toilet. Um, remember, our toilets are different, especially in the rural areas and uh, in the southern part of uh, India, where they squat on the ground. So rather than making the patient sit on a Swiss ball, uh, why don't we ask them whether they want to sit on the floor or sit on the ground? And if they say that I want to, why don't we try to do that? Right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, it is important that you choose a meaningful activity which is meaningful for your patient, not for yourself, right? So if your patient wants to gulp a large uh, pitcher of beer, probably you want to teach that. So the next question or the next point, a lot of people say that I don't reduce spasticity for spasticity sake or I don't uh, reduce synergy for the sake of reducing synergy. The next thing I do is after reducing these things, I will make them do functional activity. Why? Because they think that that is a deterrent to doing functional activity. They also think that if your patient does not have knee flexion, knee extension, uh, hip extension uh, or any activity in your hip, how will you walk? That is why we a lot of people will do activities or uh, impairment level treatments first and then go into functional activity. Is that the right uh, way to do or is it always necessary to do that? The next thing is a lot of people do impairment level exercise or um, impairment level uh, interventions which is also passive in nature. Thinking that that will improve or that will prevent, say for example, muscle contraction, or that will improve muscle strength, or it will reduce spasticity. Now for the uh, first question, should I treat the underlying impairments, then practice physical uh, functional activity? I have a video. This video, <clears throat> where you can see, uh, this is a video shot by Prakash, where you can see that 
you can if you can understand some amount of indian probably i am assuming some amount of gujarati they are asking a patient an acute patient to uh, do a knee extension right as you can see that he is finding it very difficult and he is not able to uh, do it right now one of the common things we tend to do in this particular situation from our earlier ideas in the 80s and 70s is first we will improve the activity level in the lower limb and then probably make him walk as well as make him stand now <clears throat> what we will show here is you can see after having no activity he is been given a functional active assisted movement he is doing an active assisted movement remember it is active remember it is a function and he is doing again and again now if you see in the two or third time he is able to uh, stand up by himself remember he is not doing it uh, very um, uh, very well or uh, we are not claiming that he is doing it uh, uh, to his fullest potential or anything like that but he was able to uh, do it um, so if if in this situation if he is able to do an activity which requires probably some amount of quadriceps some amount of uh, plantar flexors uh, some amount of um, muscle activity in his back and uh, probably in his hips but he is able to compensate that loss and he is able to do it without treating the underlying impairments right now the first thing a lot of people uh, say when i show this video is probably is doing uh, using the other limbs or the other muscles and for that the answer is very very simple so what he is able to achieve a particular function and if he is repeatedly doing it will improve with time now the next question uh, they ask is all right that is because it is just a, a simple um, that is because it is a simple sit to stand activity he is able to do how will i do that for upper limb the idea here is trying to change the task in such a way that it becomes easier for your patient that is very very tough we will try to give an example if i have time so what we are trying to suggest is you don't need to do an underlying treatment or improve muscle strength and then go to it right you don't want to reduce spasticity and then go and do a treatment and you don't want to increase the length of the muscle and go to a treatment why for one thing we know that we cannot reduce spasticity with new physiotherapeutic techniques uh, we know that stretching does not improve the length of the muscle so why bother doing all these things when you can actually make a patient do activity and remember in this uh, earlier video when he is doing sit to stand he is actually improving his or he is increasing his chance of increasing his activity in his quadriceps probably the plantar flexors and all the muscles and remember the range of motion is also been taken care because he is moving the joints of the lower limb so you don't need individual elements to be treated when you are doing a functional activity all the individual elements are being moved so for this question of should i treat the underlying impairments then practice it seems that it is just wasting our time so and uh, just uh, doing all sorts of things which are um, not useful also say for example uh, you're stretching or reducing spasticity with this and that right so the um, 
So the next principle along with what we have seen here is we don't need part treatment treated as a whole. That is, you don't need just dorsiflexion treatment or just hip extension treatment and then into it. One of the reasons for this is also the uh, motor control of a system is far more complex. Why do we get a dorsiflexion during a uh, gait or when does your plantar flexors work when you are walking is all context specific. What I mean by context is it is occurring to a particular situation so that training them at individual level and then going to it as a whole seems a um, few time. You think of it like this, if you want to go like Shane Wong, you don't just treat your or you don't just learn to um, rotate your wrist or rotate your uh, shoulder alone or just hop two or three steps. That's what Shane wanted when he was bowling. And then um, combine all together one day and you don't get better. If you want to be like Shane Wan, as I said uh, um, earlier, do the activity as a whole. That is go and bowl in the nets again and again and you will improve. So where do I have to practice this? We have said that we have to do functional activity. We said that we don't have to do uh, underlying interventions. That is, we don't have to do uh, isolated movements and then go to as a whole. You can straight away do a uh, whole activity. We also said that it should be meaningful for our people. And this is one of the most important things from motor control. We learned that the movements are occurring for an environment and for a context. That is, remember uh, I said uh, cricket, what bowl does, uh, what type of uh, ball is uh, Shane Wan going to bowl the next one? It depends upon who the batsman is, what was the earlier ball, what type of pitch and all those things, right? So if you want to give a patient a chance to improve, the treatment should be context specific and also environmental specific. So that's why I've given a, a, a the, uh, I'm coming to the earlier example of the uh, sitting and standing from the Swiss ball, which is not an environment he's going to use. It is not a context which he's going to encounter. So what is the encountering factor? Probably a park bench and the other things. And also remember, because it is going to happen to a context and for a particular environment, you want to mimic your treatment as far as possible to the real environment. What does it mean? If you are teaching your patient to uh, tilt a bottle, you want to have water in it. If you want to make them uh, learn to eat, you can't just ask them to just act as though you are eating without food in the hand. Because if you have food in the hand, then the context is different, the environment is different. So you want to practice activities which are meaningful, which are going to be done again and again, but at the same time, it should be done with all the elements there right what they call it as in ecological theory the affordance part of it so you want to have water in the in the jug when they are pouring it so that they learn to control this moment here and if you are going to teach them to sit and stand from a park probably do it in a park bench or something which is mimicking like that in your park bench if you don't, uh, you can do a simulation of that. That is one of the uh, classical examples is uh, obstacle training, which a lot of people do nowadays in the clinic. Obstacle training is given so that the patient is able to walk outside. So you do a real world simulation. So a simple example, just a few minutes. So this patient was a Prakash patient where he was a shoekeeper or um, a shopkeeper who had a, a shoe showroom. So he wanted to uh, remove these boxes and then take the shoe and sit on a small bench and uh, put it on the page, um, on the customers. So what they did was they uh, they asked him to bring these boxes, which you can see the shoe boxes, and they had 
put it in a rack in their clinic in different heights and asked them to practice. And one day they also went to his uh, shop and they made, made him do all those things. So they, start with re they started with real world stimulation, uh, simulation and then went back to context specific environment to practice so that he is improving in his real world activities. So these are the salient points uh, of a functional activity based approach. That is, you want to have a functional activity again and again. And remember that functional activity should be meaningful for your patients. And we think that you don't need to do uh, isolated movements or a part practice and then go to a whole. And remember when I said that earlier, there were lots of books on functional activities. A lot of authors have uh, different ideas. <clears throat> and where do we differ is we think that it is just uh, not needed for you to do isolated movements or impairment level interventions, whether it is active or passive. You can do functional activities straight away. If you do functional activities straight away, the patient does not have any problem. At the same time, you also have, can do functional activities, um, which are, uh, if you do a repeatedly functional activities, so all the other impairments like your weakness, uh, the length of the muscle, your sensory system, all these things are being stimulated or being activated. So there is no need as separate activities of those things. The other uh, five, six and seven principles, I'm not going to dwell into details because most of you will have a very good idea. When you are doing a functional activity, you want to give feedback. What type of feedback and uh, how much of feedback, all these things has to be taken into consideration. But as a general guiding principle, the feedback should be very less, very less, not more, very less, and the attention focus should be outside, not inside. What it means is the patient should not be looking into his wrist or his elbow, but looking at the external target. And remember, he has to practice more, more the practice, better he gets. Out of all these principles, uh, the last one is that is the behavioral issues, which are vital, far more important for your patient to practice. That is, if he has to do it again and again, he has to comply with the activity, the comply with your um, physiotherapy and all those things. For that, you want to understand the behavioral issues, how to motivate my patient, how to keep this motivation, what are the education you want to do, all these things uh, combined together form what we call a, as a task oriented approach. But I just want to add a tail piece. Uh, when you are doing a task oriented approach, uh, it's vital to important. Uh, it's vital to uh, remember we are going to do functional activity and we are going to do activities which are uh, meaningful for your patient. We are going to do that activity again and again. But remember, the patient's ability is vital. So if your patient wants to <clears throat> uh, say that he wants to, he thinks that he has to go back to his uh, original work of uh, carving or painting, and his right hand is affected, and the, um, the ability is right hand is very very less. You can't think that okay, I will make you draw again or paint again. Sometimes it may not be possible depending on the, uh, the assessment you make. So always remember the goals of your patient should be tailor-made for uh, according to his ability, right? So I'll just uh, recap what are the things we want to do um, uh, in a functional activity. I'm just going to uh, look into the first slide first. And because that is what I think is the most important thing, uh, do an activity again and again. And that activity should be functional and it should be uh, uh, vital for your patient, right? Uh, the simple example why I've given a marathon runner is, uh, remember a marathon runner has to be trained in the ground 
doing uh, probably 10k or 20k or 40k every day so that he improves in that he can't be doing 100 meters dash or doing exercise in his uh, gym and think that he will do uh, go and perform a marathon right so you want to do a functional activity which is vital for your patient again and again you will have far more better success because that's what the evidence is saying So I'm going to end up with, uh, uh, again, a simple video of uh, the same patient. Uh, remember, he has uh, very little activity. Uh, so we are um, giving that activity again and again. So remember, this patient has very little activity in his lower limb. and uh, But he's been made to walk. Uh, remember, he is not walking perfectly. Remember, he is not hold the patient, the Prakash is not holding the patient in his uh, uh, hips or there or some um, reticulous points which are very vital or things like that. Uh, those are all just uh, simple, uh, simple trivial things which have no value in these things. We just want to do that activity again and again. And if you do that activity again and again, you have a far more uh, bigger chance of uh, improving. So thank you for uh, listening to uh, our webinar on uh, uh, functional activity-based approach. If you have more queries, we'll be happy to um, uh, answer those things. You can comment on the comment session and uh, we'll have a discussion. Thank you so much.